effect it provides. The first painting in what Chuck considers his mature body of work, completed at age 27, was a mural-sized canvas that aspired for the expansive vistas offered by abstract expressionism, but flouted the movement's predilection for abstraction by rendering a large new, irrefutably recognizable, not with vigorously applied brushstrokes, but painted with countless small puffs of acrylic paint from an airbrush. In this case, the artist paints the thing, the figure, with, a, with painstaking verisimilitude. Monumental in scale, this is 22 feet wide, 10 feet high, but brutal in detail. This is the cesarean scar and stretch marks of the big nude. Big nude was like the mother Gaia that spawned the artist in his full mature form, although this time just his head in big self-portrait, nine foot high. Of the scale, he said, I thought the scale of Big Nude was still too small. I wanted it to feel bigger, more like Gulliver's Travels. The idea of the Lilliputians crawling over the head of a giant and not even knowing what they were on, stumbling over a beard here and falling through a nostril. I wanted to make it as big as it could be between the floor and ceiling. Big self-portrait was succeeded by a number of other large monochromatic paintings of his friends. Nancy Graves, Richard Serra, Frank James, Philip Glass, uh, this is a detail of Frank, this is Philip Glass, Joe Zucker, Robert Israel, and Keith Hollingworth, all artists. With his bevy of hyperrealist paintings, it was not long before Chuck was at the center of discussions about realism, variously referred to as new realism, super realism, and photorealism. Chuck had entered a complicated terrain. His heroes were abstract expressionists. His peers were exploring minimalism and conceptualism. He was painting faces, but he didn't want to call them portraits. He even avoided calling them faces and referred to them as heads. He was being analyzed through the rubric of realism, but he claimed that he was just as interested in the artificiality as he was in the reality of his paintings, reminding people that what looks like hair or the shadow cast by eyeglasses is really just created with paint on canvas, or as he calls it, mere, quote, colored dirt on a piece of cloth. He got in trouble with other figurative painters who thought him a fraud for painting from photographs. He never hid the fact that he painted from photographs, but bristled at the term photorealism. To Chuck, the photograph was the perfect subject. It was flat. It got all the information down on paper. He referred to each photograph as a frozen moment in time, likening the photograph to a little poem, like, to a little poem like slice of time, and then referring to the act of painting as the novelistic time frame which takes anywhere between four to 16 months to complete as he applies an infinite number of marks to build the image. He said, in order to come up with a mark making technique which would, which would make painting information stack up with photographic information, I tried to purge my work of as much of the baggage of traditional portrait painting as I could. To avoid a painterly brush stroke and surface, I used some pretty devious means, such as razor blades, electric drills, and airbrushes. I also work as thinly as possible, and I don't use white paint, as it tends to build up and become chalky and opaque. In fact, in a 9 by 7 foot picture, I only use a couple of tablespoons of black paint to cover the entire canvas. So he was complaining when he um, was paying his taxes that the only thing he can declare as expenses was a $1.75 tube of paint for, for the whole year. In 1970, Chuck was 30 years old, by which time he had completed his MFA from Yale, a Fulbright scholarship in Vienna, a brief teaching stint at the University of Massachusetts, and was among the early artists and settlers in Soho, New York. On the occasion of his first solo exhibition in New York showing his startlingly real paintings, of faces that were referred to as a rogues gallery of large mugshots, shots. He discussed his monochromatic paintings of faces 
in an art forum interview and said, it would be very wrong to conclude that the figure as a valid art form is no longer visible, viable. However, it is useless to try and revive figurative art by pumping it full of outworn humanist notions. He had avoided calling paintings portraits and deliberately chose to paint friends who were back then anonymous so that viewers could not recognize the subjects. The painting Richard is of the sculptor Richard Serra, back then completely unknown. He said, I don't want the viewer to recognize the head of Fidel Castro and think he has understood my work. Even his preferred reference to the paintings as heads rather than faces underscores the anonymity of the images he sought. He also wanted to differentiate his paintings from the pop superstars that Andy Warhol silk screened onto canvases. This deliberate distance is most salient in his own response to the first giant head he painted, which was his. He said, I referred to it as him. And for nearly all his subjects, he deliberately posed them so that they had blank expressions on the faces. All this may come, as, come across as cold. How could one possibly leech humanism from faces painted without any flattery such that the realism easily identified with his paintings resides not only in the extremely photographic likeness of his early canvases, but in the unflinching human reality of disheveled hair, pores, wrinkles, crooked teeth, and even facial paralysis, which he has painted larger than life with each human head covering a canvas 10 feet high. But taken in the context of his time, his assertion is a reflection of the predominant sensibility among artists then. By the time he was an MFA student at Yale in the early 1960s, the thrall of abstract expressionism was so powerful that the proverbial pendulum was swinging from its storm und Drang, his intense gravitas, and indulgence of the sublime, to the fascination with the banal of pop and the preoccupation with the almost mechanical process of minimalism. Throughout his student years, he cranked out canvases of gestural abstraction, flinging paint on the canvas on the floor, as many young artists did in the spirit of Jackson Pollock's indelible body language captured in Hans Neyman's film. Close was a young teen when, upon seeing a Pollock painting for the first time, he was so profoundly shocked, he said it was as if he had heard profanities from the pulpit of a church. But transgression can be liberating. And upon returning home from the museum where he saw the painting, he was immediately dripping paint all over his own paintings. <coughs> of the abstract expressionist masters, his true hero was Willem de Kooning, such that the first time he met him, he said, it's really nice to meet somebody who has made a few more de Koonings than I have. Artists emerging at the heels of the abstract expressionists yearned to shed an influence difficult to compete with. In 1953, Robert Rauschenberg attempted this purge by literal eradication when he asked the Kooning for a drawing he could completely erase, a case of vanish by vanish. I'm sorry, I don't know why the image is not appearing. Sorry. But uh, you must be familiar with that work. <laughs> it's, well, it looks like a piece of paper, but, but there was actually a drawing made by yeah. Kooning, and legend has it that when Robert Rauschenberg approached him, he, Kooning was cooperative and said, OK, you really want to erase it. I'm going to give you a very tough drawing to erase. So it was a very complicated thing. So I'm sorry, unfortunately, uh, the image is not appearing here. Um, when Chuck claimed, I have made Hans Hoffmann's easily as good as Hans Hoffmann, and sometimes better, it was said not out of arrogance, but of critical self-awareness that painting something that looks like art does not necessarily make one a good artist. Faced with a challenge of breaking free of his addiction to the pruning shapes and colors, he first dabbled in pop, incorporating <coughs> images from magazines and record album covers in 3D constructions. In 1967, the same year, the rock musical Hair became, ah, uh, these images are not appearing. I wonder if um, it's going to switch. I'm sorry, sorry but switch. this might be a recurring problem. Oh.
same year, the rock musical hair became the subject of controversy for the nudity that closed its first act. Chuck was teaching at the University of Massachusetts and exhibited an installation of pop-oriented works that included photographs of full frontal male nudity in the student union building. Bowing to the pressure from protests against his exhibition, the school administration instructed campus police to raid the show and shut it down. With the support of the American Civil Liberties Union, Close brought a suit against the college with stating, art is as fully protected by the Constitution as political or social speech. Although later overturned an appeal, the district judge initially ruled in Close's favor, stating the removal of the exhibition as a, a denial of his right to freedom of expression. And this original decision is cited regularly as the first to extend freedom of speech to the visual arts. In 1995, the University of Massachusetts awarded Close an honorary doctorate of the arts. And last year, 47 years after his exhibition at the university was forcibly taken down, his solo exhibition, Chuck Close photographs, traveled to the university. Among the works included were studies of the model for Big Dude. The model was an employee at the university at the time Close was teaching there. It is, in a way, a homecoming. So the same year his exhibition was censored for images of nudity, he painted this modern-day cinema's topic Odalisk, big nude with a required Italian to take down. Besides the biographical anecdote behind it, this painting marks the birth of Chuck's own personal idiom as an artist. His pop art installations were an unsatisfactory shift. Chuck is a dyed-in-the-wool painter, but he needed to go back to painting that had none of his ingrained abstract expressionist habits. He, according to himself, was a nervous wreck. A slob, he says, and flinging paint and making sweeping gestures with a brush dripping with paint fed his neurotic, messy temperament, and he did not want to be captive to his own nature. He is always told he was always told he had a good color sense, so he decided to purge color altogether. He was always told he had a good hand, that his brush strokes had flair. He realized this to mean he had good art handwriting. His hand moved in characteristically cliché shapes. His paintbrushes had taken on a mystical air. Some had been lucky. A painting would go well if I used a certain brush. So he got rid of his paintbrushes. Thick oil paint was luxuriant and indulgent. So he decided to apply only thin washes of acrylic, using sponges, rags, and an airbrush tool. The restrictions went so far as to decide that in painting a black and white image, he would not even use white paint. The proverbial carte blanche, the fresh page for him to start anew, was assiduously prepared. He applied a dozen coats of gesso, sanding carefully after each coat dried so that the final canvas was as extremely smooth and polished as photographic paper. As he painted from the photograph, he used razor blades and an eraser attached to an electric drill to reveal the white ground underneath instead of adding white paint. Chuck noted that the suffering experience by the first generation abstract expressionists yielded canvases that were raw in their tortured anguish, but this had turned into a mannerist system in the hands of succeeding artists. He said, they nailed it down so well that I couldn't do anything but weak impersonations of the work. Agitating against the expressionist angst of the gestural abstraction he had assimilated, assimilated into his work so well, he looked to add Reinhardt instead. Reinhardt, just one year younger than Pollock, has passed <coughs> strategies that went against the grain of abstract expressionist impulse, such as brushwork that brushes out the brushwork, the strictest formula for the freest artistic freedom, the completest control for the purest spontaneity, or in favoring the meticulous, conceptually driven fabrication of an image over the improvisational and intuitive physicality